how these affect species richness is not only a consequence of this, the biology of these species. These are extrinsic factors. And evolutionary phylogenetic factors in historical events are somewhat in between. It depends both on the biology of the species and characteristics of the environment and the time where the species is. So when we look at the spatial patterns and how we model it, how we study it, we have to be a little clear on how, on, on what are the processes that we want to describe. And we cannot, we will not be able to differentiate between the effects of population processes and dispersion and migration, but we may be able to differentiate from the statistical perspective what are the endogenous or intrinsic factors and what are the exogenous or extrinsic factors, right? Okay, let's then imagine a plain vanilla world. A plain vanilla world is a world that's really boring and it's homogeneous, like nothing different happens. You can go anywhere and it's all the same. And also, all species are similar. They are all very, very, very alike. But they still have this label that says, this is one species and this is the other species. And now, we're going to think of how the world would look if that was the case. So, individuals, regardless of species, they are ecologically identical. They don't have different preferences. They are all behave the same. Sites or localities, they have a maximum carrying capacity, which we call K, and are always saturated. So all sites, they can harbor the same number of, of individuals, regardless of species. And this carrying capacity for the site is always saturated. It's always the number of individuals that can be in a, a single place, this exact same number is always there. So in this world, in the simplified world, individual dies at random. It doesn't matter what the species they are, they just die. You can imagine like a hurricane going there and killing individuals randomly. You can imagine like there is suddenly a burst of a disease and some die. It doesn't matter. Individuals die and it doesn't matter what the species they are. So the spots left by these dead individuals are immediately filled. They, so the, the space left of, uh, by the individuals that died are immediately recolonized. And who is colonizing this space? The, uh, the, it, these, these spaces are colonized by reproduction of individuals that survived. So suddenly some die and they are replaced by the next generation. And of course, it, the individuals that reproduce are those that survived. And of course, when they do reproduce, their next generation still carry the same label. They are the same species, right? So, the individuals that are in a given site, they will reproduce, generating the next generation, but also there is migration. So a pair of individuals may reproduce, a pair of individuals in the neighboring site may reproduce and send migrants to colonize this particular place. So now there is this interchange of uh, individuals from one site to another. So there is migration, migration. 
And the distance that this migration event may happen, the maximum distance, is what we call the neighborhood. So it's, it's how, how many sites beyond uh, the one that the original parents are living, a migrant can move to recolonize empty spaces. So this maximum dispersal distance, which is, is what we call the parameter G. So we have set this very simplified world. Yes, it is, uh, it's not a real, but what can we, how can we use this simplified world to understand or to study uh, ecology? Well, here is uh, local colonization, the two parameters M, and there you see this carrying, uh, carrying cap uh, dispersal capacity. So here there's very short uh, uh, dispersal, and here there's very long dispersal. And here, uh, the reproduction or the recolonization will be mostly from the species, that, the individuals that survive in a given locality. And here, M, there will be uh, uh, less individuals recolonizing from that particular place. And in every moment in this, in this model, there will be a mortality equal to 10. Well, the numbers don't matter. It's just a relative uh, relationship between them. So if there is uh, small local colonization and small dispersal capacity, after a couple generations, that's how the map of species richness is going to look like in this very simplified world. When you increase dispersal capacity, you increase species richness. And how can I tell that the map on the right is richer? Well, when we look at this color bar, we, you can see that this, this map has more red-ish cells, and it means that there are more species there. So just increasing dispersal capacity, you increase species richness over time. Also, when you increase local colonization, you increase the species richness. But now, compare these two maps. What are the differences? I'm sorry? The one is heterogeneous, the other one is homogeneous. Yeah, this is relatively homogeneous, right? Kind of flat. There's the same number of species everywhere. And this one over here, there is a difference. It's more heterogeneous. The number of species is not constant over space. But there's also something special about this map. The way the heterogeneity is structured in space. As you can see, there's more species richness in the middle than there are in the border. Right? Can you see that? This is what we call spatial structure. So in this very simplified world that no one thinks it's real, we can generate maps of species richness. We can generate a structure. And look, I'm using randomness. I'm using randomness, like the, the, no species are different, no individuals are different, and yet we have a pattern emerging from a random model. So when we look at the map of species richness, maybe, maybe we don't need to invoke that much biology to study that map. It may be the case 
It could be the case, certainly, that a map of species richness could be a consequence of stochastic processes or random processes. And that's very interesting, isn't it? It's pretty interesting. We ecologists are trained to think only on the particular biology of this plant or this animal. And we know everything about its nature and how it interacts with the other species. And then, having all this knowledge, we try to combine the knowledge between species and then look at the map of species richness. But it's really complex because there's so much information to process. And this map of species richness, it's like pretty hard to explain. But it may be the case, it could be the case, that even when there's no biology going on, other than just spatial processes, there will be still a map of species richness. I find that really interesting. I find that really daunting. So now I'm going to increase mortality. So here in each generation, only 10 individuals were dying. Now in this new world here, more individuals are dying every generation. Can we generate, can we create an expectation to how the, the four maps over here is going to be different from these ones? Do you think you will see more flat or more pattern? You think you see more homogeneity or more heterogeneity? Do you think you're going to see more species richness or less species richness? Less species richness. And more pattern or less pattern? Less pattern. Who thinks it's more pattern? Who thinks it's less pattern? Who doesn't think? <laughs> well, uh, compared to the other one, so when you compare this map with this map, the only difference is the mortality rate. And as you can see, there's less species richness. The pattern kind of looked the same to me. And that's why we are here. We're going to learn a new tool today in which we can actually measure a pattern like and say how much spatial pattern there is here and we'll have a number for that. And that's pretty interesting too. And to my eyes, less species richness here than there. And the only difference is mortality. But this looks kind of flat to me, doesn't it? Here, less species richness here than here. But there's a pretty strong pattern here. Can you see that pattern? More species in the middle, less species in the corners. And more green here than over there, so less species. But kind of flat to me. So what does this plain vanilla world, this surreal world tells us? Well, it tells us that simplified population processes, very simplified population process, without much biology, is able to generate spatial patterns. So by studying spatial patterns, we can capture uh, how the world works. We can, we can understand, we can try to understand or describe how ecological world works. And what else we learned? Dispersal capacity generates spatial patterns. 
right? It's, it's actually uh, expected, isn't it? So if, if one species is moving around and some species moves around very far or migrates really far, it's kind of expected that its range is going to be larger, right? And also, if there is local colonization, the larger the local colonization, the more pattern you will see. So in this world over here, when individuals that live here reproduce, the, this generation, these new individuals, these newborns, they can migrate anywhere in this map. So if they can go anywhere in the map, it's probably going to mix the entire richness here. However, in this map over here, when there is reproduction, the, these newborns can only migrate to the next cell. So this cell over here kind of contaminates or influence or is related, it is connected, it has this bond with the nearby cell. Here, the connection or, or the relationship between cells are much longer and sites have relationship with probably all other sites in the map. So, this migration process is, has a very strong, has very strong power to drive the patterns, whatever patterns we are watching or, or studying. So it's really important to think on migration events and how the species behave in space so that we can study these spatial patterns. And as you see, there's no, not much pattern here, and the difference between these two maps is only local colonization. So, are we okay with this simplified world? Comments? No? You think it's useful to simplify stuff? Nature is too complex. Sometimes it's easy to, to make your own world in the computer. It's kind of a matrix world. You can actually play with each individual and say, okay, you're gonna be here. You're gonna be there. So, so people don't complain you are actually playing around with real individuals. But still, it's pretty useful to, to understand what nature, how nature would be if that was the case. So we can eliminate the effects of environment, history, everything. Okay, how have uh, researchers in ecology or in biology studied these spatial patterns? Um, it turns out that um, the spatial statistics um, were um, the, the spatial statistics was kind of independently designed in multiple fields of science. Uh, we can cite, we can mention uh, uh, economy or econometric, econometry, sociology, geography, geology, demography, epidemiology. These are all sciences that use uh, heavy spatial statistics. And of course, genetics, ecology, all uh, uh, more fields of biology also look at spatial patterns or how nature is structured in space. But it turns out that uh, ecology and genetics they inherited 
spatial, statistics, spatial statistics or spa, uh, statistical methodology from different fields. Uh, genetics inherited spatial statistics from geography, while ecology inherited spatial statistics from geology. So there is this historical, uh, uh, historical event that affected uh, what kind of methodology or statistical approach uh, this uh, we're going to use if we are studying genetics or ecology, or it's going to be more familiar to geneticists and ecologists.